I'm supposed to be talking today about epistemological problems of economics. Uh, I'd recommend for reading on epistemological problems of economics, uh, the book by Mises, Epistemological Problems of Economics. <laughs> Somehow that fits in. Uh, also, the uh, uh, about the first 142 pages of Human Action there would be good to read. There uh, is a large extent in this talk. I'll be going over material you've heard already. Uh, Hans Hoppe gave a lecture that covered a lot of the topics I'll be giving. But it's uh, very difficult material, so I hope you don't mind hearing some of the same things again. At least it's difficult if you're, you'll find it somewhat difficult if you're like any of the students who've been here in the 23 or so years I've been lecturing here. Now, Walter Block, who's fortunately not here, uh, <laughs> tells me that I, uh, is, uh, tells me I should open my lectures with a joke, but I don't know too many epistemology jokes. I'm sure there are some, but I will give you one. My great friend, uh, Father Sadowski, who's retired, he used to teach philosophy at Fordham, told me that he likes to tell his introductory philosophy classes that the, the word philosophy comes from the Greek word philosophia, which means philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, uh, what I want to uh, discuss is, uh, first is the fundamental notion that uh, in Mises and Rothbard and, uh, ha have in conducting economics is that economics develops the implication, the implications of the statement that human beings act. So we want to consider first what's meant by an action. What do we mean by an action? Well, also, uh, any thing that we do that use it, that we have a certain end that we're using means to achieve it, like I'm now lecturing to you or you're listening to my lecture. I hope you're listening anyway. Probably be better off not to, but I hope you're listening anyway. So anything we, anything that we have where it's use of means to uh, to achieve an end is an action. Now, one mistake sometimes people make, they think of an act, when we're talking about action, we're talking about something out there in the world. We're talking about events in the world, things that take place in the world. Sometimes people have the, the notion when they're reading human action that somehow action is something just that goes on inside us. We were thinking about what to do, and that's the real action. Then they think of, uh, when they're thinking about Mises' praxeology, they have some notion that, well, there's something going on inside our minds, so how would we know whether this applies to other people? Maybe this is just some whatever Mises is talking about is just something going on in each of our minds, but how do we know that, even if it sounds convincing, how we know that it applies to other people. Well, uh, Mises isn't Descartes. He's not trying to solve some problem of skepticism about the external world. Actions are out there, so it isn't a qu we don't have any skeptical problem. Uh, the theorems of praxeology that Mises develops, human action, are not uh, things that uh, theorems about events, about things in person's mind, but they're about actions, so they're not, uh, uh, praxeology is not introspective psychology, it's not a discipline in where we try to consider what we're thinking about or what we're feeling or various sensations we have and do descriptions of them, it's about action. Now, action normally involves some sort of physical movement, say I'm lecturing their sounds coming out of my mouth or I'm moving my hands. But there are cases where you can act without any physical movement or change. For example, suppose I said, uh, all those who agree with that me, please signify by remaining seated. So 
You've all remained seated, so you all have agreed with me that you can act without any physical movement, you see. So, but in most cases, action does involve some physical movement. So, this is what we're talking about. Actions, things out in the world, in most cases, involving some physical movement. Now, uh, so we have, so we're starting off with the statement, human beings act. Now, Mises has, uh, Two principles, what he said he wants to do, he then wants to deduce various things about action. We're starting human beings act. Now, he has two principles that he relies on in his, this process of deduction. One is called, uh, methodological individualism. Put this. Oh, what, what do I, I do here? I'm, oh, yes, that's, an, oh, good. It, it worked. Now, methodological individualism is the uh, view or the doctrine only individuals act. Uh, supposing, supposing we say, uh, You're yourself. well, oh, this is this is too confusing. This is too high tech. <laughs> I don't like I don't like this stuff. <laughs> Whatever happened to blackboards? I, I'm old enough to remember when blackboards were really black. To, I, I, I don't even approve of green blackboards. It's just not right. This is, I don't like this. No. So, uh, methodological individualism, they say, only individuals act. Now, but, so, don't, but you might say, well, don't we have statements such that we can make statements such as, uh, the United States, uh, declared war on Japan in December 8th, 1941. Doesn't that make sense? But the United States isn't an individual, so is this consistent with methodological individualism? Uh, does anybody want to try to answer that? Uh, yes. Um, even though you use it's always individual, but it was carried out through the action attached to it and referred to it. Yes, that's a very good answer. In fact, you sound like you should be giving the lecture. <laughs> me. Uh, so, yes, this is, so when we have a statement where a collective, we're attributing action to a collective entity like the United States declared war on Japan, this is reducible to statements that by individuals in this case, uh, we would explain that by saying uh, certain members of Congress following uh, President Roosevelt's speech uh, voted in a certain way, and as a result of that, other individuals acted in various ways. It would be pretty complicated to spell out this, der- how, what exactly, uh, how this thing was to be reduced. If you say the United States declared war on Japan, how it was to be reduced, but you you would have to make the reduction. You couldn't just say the collective entity, the United States, has acted without uh, reducing it to individuals. Now, one uh, complication here I'll put in, when you talk about this reduction to individuals, it doesn't follow that you can get rid, in all cases, you could get rid of the reference to the collective entity. It might not be that Suppose you say you can forget about talking about the United States altogether. You would just have particular people voting in a certain way and uh, doing other things. And that would be what the sentence, the United States declared war, meant. That would just be these individuals acting. And you wouldn't need to bring in the United States at all. That doesn't follow from methodological individualism. It's just that you might have to put in at some stage in your explanation the United States declared war. But it's just that uh, in the ultimate stage, you wouldn't have the reference to the collective entity. You see, uh, I remember uh, uh, Alan Garfinkel in a book called Forms of Explanation criticized methodological individualism. He said, well, but you couldn't, you know, you say, you say, uh, in such certain cases where you're mentioning a collective entity, you can't get rid of the 
collective entity in your explanation if you bring in individuals. But the point he missed was that you can do it in stages. You know, you're, you do start with the collective entity, but then you end up just with individuals. I remember uh, Bob Nozick, I, when once I, I visited him, he was telling me Garfinkel had just come to see him, and he was telling me about this argument. He said, he said, what an idiot that guy was. He didn't see <laughs> this. So I, I've, re, I've always remembered that point since Nozick's conversation. When, uh, if, you, if you could get an argument by Nozick, you'd know you had done something pretty good. He, he was the, I should, a uh, bit of a digression, but that's never stopped me. He was the fastest person in argument I've ever met. He usually had the refutation of what you said before you finished <laughs> your, before you finished your argument. So, uh, as I say, there are, uh, methodological individuals only individuals act. Now, th there are people who deny this view, uh, some people think Hegel denied it, although that can be disputed that Hegel talks about certain, the, the, the Weltgeist, which is kind of the, the world spirit that's developing throughout history. And Mises takes him to be talking about a collective mind, some sort of universal mind that isn't an individual that's developing. That's a controversial interpretation, but that would be an example of someone who denied methodological individualism. Uh, there, there are others. There, uh, the American philosopher Josiah Royce thought that animal species were at, could act, not just individual animals, but the, so the whole species could act as a separate body. But that isn't a view that's usually held. Now, the other principle let's hope I don't have any disasters writing this one, is a methodological singularism. Yeah. <coughs> now, uh, this is, isn't stressed too much by... Uh, You're censoring yourself again. Oh, <laughs> what is going on here? Hmm. Yeah, my pod. Yeah, it's the, <laughs> the iPod doesn't get you the internet will. Uh, <laughs> all right, so... Uh, this is a methodological singularism isn't usually stressed by uh, most of the lectures, but I think it's a very important point. It's so important that I sometimes ask this on the final exam if anyone interested in taking that. So uh, this is an important, important concept. Uh, what Mises meant by this is that you take any particular action you want, like my lecturing or uh, someone uh, eating breakfast or any action you want, and you try to disregard all the particular features of the actual, the content of that particular action. You say, what is the involved in the form of any action? What characteristics does something have that make it an action, regardless of what the action is. And the way you find out this is by talk, thinking of any particular action you want and trying to blot out or abstract from the particular content of the action and just ask, what are the uh, general features that in this action? So, you see, I think the reason Mises does this, it answers right away the qu uh, sort of uh, challenge that the logical positivists that I'll be talking about later raise. They say, well, M Mises is just talking about certain concepts that he's defined in a certain way, but how do we know these have any reference to the real world? He's just come up with a certain set of definitions, and he's talking about playing around with these definitions, but how do we know these actually apply to the world? Well, we know that right from the start because, according to methodological singularism, we're talking about a particular any action. So we have an action right there. We, we're starting with the action. So we know it's we're talking about something in the world simply because we got the action right to begin with. It isn't that uh, we're talking about concepts or some notions in our own mind, as I mentioned before, but I'll 
mention again because it's such a crucial point, we're talking about actions out there in the world. So this is applying to, so we don't have this problem of how do we know that the concepts really apply? How do we know that they're not just a system of definitions? Now, you might have noticed one seeming anomaly in what I've said so far is I said Mises is trying to come up with deductions from the statement that human beings act, but I then went on to talk about methodological individualism, the view that only individuals act. But you might ask, how is does it follow from the statements that the statement that human beings act that only individuals act? It seems like that doesn't follow what's supposed to be the deduction there. Uh, what it doesn't seem like it follows in any uh, formal sense. Uh, aren't we just adding, don't you have to add some other premise to get from human beings act to only individuals act taking? I suppose individuals would refer to human beings, so that human beings act, only human beings act. How do you derive that? Uh, I think the answer here is that we're not, when Mises is talking, we're not talking about deduction in a the sense that this is used in mathematical logic and formal logic, where we start off with certain specified axioms, and then we can represent we usually represent symbols, we have symbols, to, uh, and then try to deduce formally what follows from these a- axioms, where this is done kind of a symbolic way, just like in a solving a mathematical equation. The deduction that Mises is talking about is a more informal kind of deduction, it's what's sometimes called explication. I think Rudolf Carnap, who's one of the logical positivists I'll be talking about later uses the term explication, although what Mises had in mind, I think, is somewhat different from what he meant. But what explication involves is that we have just it's, it's to start with some grasp of action since we ourselves act, and we're asking what are the necessary features of that notion of action. We're starting with a particular action. we asking what are the formal features of action, well, again, we disregard the particular content of the action. We ask what are the formal features and try to come up with a deduction in the sense that we're just by thinking about the action, we see what are the necessary features of action. But it isn't a deduction in the sense in which you find this, say, in a, a book of mathematics or in a, a Work uh, article using symbolic logic where we have a formally specified system. You'd have to put in, if you wanted to do that, I, there are people who have that in mind for human action, you'd have to put in a lot more axioms and formal definitions to do that. That isn't the way Mises proceeds. Uh, now, one thing I want to talk I would you would naturally expect me now to talk about some of the implications of the axiom of action that human beings act. But I want to say something first about how we have to, how we have to, in trying to come up with the implications, we have to be very careful. This is one thing where uh, Austrian economics, praxeology is very different from other kinds of economics, from neoclassical economics, we have to be careful to uh, include only things that actually do follow from the axiom of action. Uh, we can't put in extra extra things that uh, might seem plausible to us, but not formal implications in the way I've explained or informal implications, I should say, way of explaining of the notion of action. And I want to devote some time to what I think is one of the most uh, confused topics, is notion of uh, 
interper- utility, especially interpersonal utility comparisons. Uh, the, sometimes people, we have, the, you'll see the view, uh, you probably come across in reading the view, uh, in Austrian economics it holds that you can't measure interpersonal utility. And so sometimes people think, well, uh, the reason for this is, you'll, you'll see this, which I don't, uh, I don't accept this argument and say, well, utility is an intensive magnitude. It's not something, it's not a physical quantity stretched out when we talk about utility. It's sort of something mental and you can't measure uh, intensive magnitudes. It's, it, you don't have a physical dimension. You, so, therefore, you can't come up with a, even a personal measure of utility, much less an interpersonal measure of utility. Now, this argument, I think, is not the way to think about utility at all. When, remember, we're only concerned now with what follows from the uh, action acts and what follows when we say that human beings act. Well, what is involved in an action, in an action, we're choosing one thing over something else. Say, uh, you're choosing now to listen to me lecture as opposed to something else you might be doing. You're probably regretting your choice now, <laughs> uh, but that's something else. So you've chosen... <laughs> oh, sorry. It's a low amount of utility. For oh, <laughs> ah, well, now, now we're going to see that this, this is a, uh, I'm glad you say that because this is getting into one of the fallacies I want to talk about. Not that in fact you should say it's a high amount of utility, but it's the whole, this is in, thinking about utility as in amounts is what we need to get away from. So you see, as you say, any action involves some choice of what to do. So, if uh, one of the theorems of praxeology is you always choose your most highly valued action. We know this because you're really characterizing the most highly valued actions, the one you do choose. It isn't that we've defined it that way, but I mean, it, it's just we know the one you is most highly valued by the one you choose, you choose. So we have in the notion of action, we have choice. So we have alternatives. You're all, you're choosing your most highly value. And we have this in choice involves a preference for at least one choice over another. If you have several choices, we can think of ranking the choices, what's your first choice, what's your second choice, what's your third choice, so on, depending on how many alternatives there are. Now, this is the crucial point, this is the thing to remember. In When we talk about utility in Austrian economics, we mean only preference in this sense that you've chosen one thing over another. This is all that's meant. And why is this all that's meant? Because that's all that follows from the notion of action. Now, what we don't mean is that there's some, is something like this. That, and this is something that's, where Austrian economics is very di- different from neoclassical economics. And here I need to give you some background, some, uh, going, we have to go back to the 18th century to get some of the background. Uh, now, there's some philosophers who held this view. They say, when, whenever we act, we, we are trying to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. Uh, they say, say, when, when you act, there's usually some sort of feeling tone to your experience. You, uh, Say you're probably feeling bored now, or some mood you have, or some, you can imagine, say, something you like doing very much, you feel very excited about this. So, according to some philosophers, there's always some kind of feeling tone attached to our experience. And what we're trying, we're always trying to do is to get the best possible 
uh, feeling tone. We're trying to ma- minimize painful feeling tone, maximize pleasure. We're trying to always get the most pleasure, minimize pain. Now you might say, well, aren't there obvious counterexamples like say, sometimes people will go through painful exercises or go to the dentist because you want your might involve a lot of pain, but then people who like this view would say, well, but you're just doing that because you think this will maximize your long-term balance of pleasure over pain. Now, I don't personally think this is a very good theory, but there are people who held it. The one, probably one of the first to hold it was the, there's a French, uh, Philosopher Helvetius, uh, I'll put him down. I hope I don't go into any. We're malfunctioning again. Oh, no. this one. Uh, okay, we'll put him down. Okay, uh, who had the view that, that I've just given that we're always, we're always trying to maximize pleasure over pain. And the most, uh, most famously, uh, the English uh, legal reformer and Philosopher Jeremy Bentham held this view. Let's see, did I put this? Down? Oh, I got this. Okay, now uh, you might. Why did I mention this view? Well, uh, this is this view became very influential in the development of economics. A lot of the 19th century economists held this view. Uh, John Stuart Mill. You remember Ralph talked about in somewhat less than enthusiastic terms, uh, was a utilitarian, although quite a modified one, and uh, other economists held this. Uh, W.S. Jevons, who was one of the founders of the theory of marginal utility, and it's still quite influential today, sort of the view, I think probably most prominent among many neoclassical economists, is that People are trying to maximize utility in something close to this sense, but we can't measure this utility, so we can't really do much with this, but this is what people are trying to maximize. Now, as I say, uh, Austrian economics doesn't agree with this theory, not because it's the wrong theory, although I think it probably is a wrong theory, but it doesn't follow from the action axiom that this account is true. So all that you get from the action axiom is that people have preference. People will choose their most highly valued preferences, and we can rank preferences first, second, third, so on. So when when Austrians talk about utility, it's only in the purely formal sense, like you, when you say you're maximizing your utility, it just means you're choosing your most highly valued preference. It isn't that utility is some thing out there like uh, that we're trying to maximize or get the most of. So there isn't any, when you say, as some people do, uh, well, we can't measure interpersonal, we can't measure utility because it's not, you can't measure in intensive magnitude. In Austrian economics, we're not talking about a magnitude of some quantity at all. We're just talking about this notion of preference, which I say is, uh, you'll see this term, is ordinal rather than cardinal. I mean, ordinal just means first, second, third, rather than cardinal, where we would have certain units of a given quantity. So uh, the reason I stress this is uh, it may not at all be the case that you can't measure an intensive magnitude. There, there are people who think you can do that, but we can avoid getting into that controversy because we're not talking about a magnitude at all. All right, now, uh, before I get to the logical positives, there's always a lot of fun uh, talking about them because... Uh, Mises regarded them as one of his main enemies, and fights are always a lot of fun to talk about. Not as much fun as professional wrestling, but, you know, we can't have everything. Uh, uh, Now, 
One of the points uh, Mises makes about action is that action involves uh, always involves uncertainty about the future. Uh, and this one I want to talk about because this one I think uh, also is a point that's misunderstood uh, in uh, by many people. That uh, what is meant by what does he mean when he talks about uncertainty about the future? Well, uh, supposing, let's say, I knew that uh, this building was going to collapse in half an hour from now, and there was nothing I could do to prevent it, so then it wouldn't make sense for me to try to do something, say, to try to reinforce the building or to call some kind of emergency people on the scene to try to deal with it. If I knew that the building was going to fall down, that would be it. There's nothing I could do about it. So if you know that something is going to happen, regardless of what you can do about it, then action in, wouldn't make sense because the thing is, in your view, going to happen, come what may, so why would you try to do it? Uh, yeah. Would not doing something also be an action? Uh, well, uh, you're certainly right that, according to Mises, not doing something counts as an action, but it doesn't follow from that that not doing something counts as an action, trying to deal with this situation. You see, that's I mean, you're quite right, that counts as an action. I mean, uh, what I, I said, or at least I hope I said, was that an action trying to alter the situation wouldn't make any sense. But you're, you're quite right that uh, Mises does say not doing anything counts as an action, but you know, it's not. It's just you wouldn't be doing anything about that. Uh, yeah. Um, I get where you're going with this, and I, I, the action axiom, but what about... If uncertainty, if a certain level of uncertainty, doesn't that also make you perhaps not unwilling, but less willing to act? So, for example, if I have a, you know, if I, but I'm not certain that the means I want to employ is actually going to lead to change in that. If there's no, if I have no certainty in the cause and effect relationship, gamble whether or not my action is all that I want. Won't that also stop me from acting? Is there some balance amount of uncertainty? Ah, now that, that's a very good point. I see there's a sign here that says, I'm please repeat audience questions before answering. So, uh, the point... <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I don't always follow instructions. <laughs> so, the point, where there were two points that... Uh, I think the, the basic point was that uh, I had suggested that uh, cer certainty about what was going to happen would... Uh, stop you from acting and the suggestion was well wouldn't uncertainty also stop you from acting if you didn't say uh, if I didn't know certain things that if I was uncertain that uh, doing something would get me what I wanted wouldn't that stop me from action I think that's a very good point it might very well you would have to at least have some tr beliefs about the effects of your action in order to act but that's, is, I'm sure, quite consistent with what I was saying. I was just dealing with this particular point about uh, if you know that something is going to happen, you wouldn't, it, nothing you could do to stop it that wouldn't stop you from acting. I should say, that does, it, it, it wouldn't be right to say, as I think you did, that changes the action axiom. The action axiom is still the same, but it's just what are the conditions under which you act. But uh, the reason I mention this is that this point that uh, is that some people really blow up this notion of uncertainty about the future in quite a uh, radical way. They think, well, in order to act, the future has to be really uncertain in some much more radical sense than I've explained. And this doesn't follow from the action axiom at all. Uh, for example, they'll say, well, you can't, when they say, you, you can't know how you, they, you can't know the future at all. Uh, but, I mean, you could certainly know there's nothing inconsistent, I think, about knowing how you will act. 
that wouldn't stop you from acting. Suppose I say, well, I know I'm going to have cereal for breakfast tomorrow. Uh, there's nothing in saying that that stops me from having cereal tomorrow. Uh, some people, uh, there's certain uh, economists like Ludwig Lachmann, I'll put him down. Yeah, I could go to a new piece of paper, might as well. I do something wrong here. Oh, good. Now, he, he was, uh, he wrote a very good book on capital theory, but he was a radical subjectivist, and he, he thought that the future is completely uncertain. We don't really know anything about the future. Just the fact that something is in, hap- is in the future somehow prevents us from saying that we know something about it. There's uh, some people, I won't mention names at certain universities, seem to uh, uh, teach Austrian economics, seem to think there's some kind of profound philosophical argument that we don't know the future. And if there is one, I'd like to know what it is. I've never encountered one. There's the only way we're uh, not knowing the future, according to the, uh, the, what falls from the action axiom, is that just that if we know that something's going to happen, come what may, then there's no point to trying to do anything about it. Uh, now, those are some, uh, just a few implications of the action axiom, but what I want to talk about in the time left is a group of people that don't like this uh, way of uh, doing economics. They think it's, uh, they don't like the sort of deductivism or notion of what we're trying to do in Austrian economics, coming up with the necessary features of an action. They they don't think that when we're talking about events in the world, events have necessary features. They they reject this whole notion. And uh, the group I want to mention, this is one that uh, Hans Hoppe discussed in his lecture on uh, Monday, it, the logical positivists. These were ones that, uh, this was a group uh, headed by uh, Moritz Schlick, I'll put him, him in, uh, at the, who was professor of philosophy at the University of Vienna. I should say, uh, Schlick illustrates uh, one of the dangers, some of the dangers of academic life for some of you who might want to become uh, professors, you should bear in mind what happened to Schlick. Uh, Schlick once uh, failed a student in on his uh, PhD exams. And the student wasn't very happy about being failed, as you might imagine. So he, the next day, he came into Schlick's office and shot him dead. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there are conflicting accounts of what, why he did that. Some people think the reason he did it was that uh, Schlick was uh, romantically involved with a woman he was always he was also interested in. But there, there are disputed accounts of this. But in any event, the, he was uh, the, the person who did it. I think his name was Noblock, Was uh, of course arrested and put in prison. But then, after the uh, Nazis took over Austria and March 1938, I think he was released, and then he ven- I think he wound up his life as a forest ranger. But, uh, that doesn't have much to do with praxeology. <laughs> you know. It's more interesting than at least some of these epistemological problems. But all right, so the logical positivists, uh, and now one I should mention, you know, uh, as you say, Hans mentioned some of the names, there was Rudolf Carnap, who... Uh, is actually a German philosopher. People sometimes think he was Austrian, but he wasn't. He was German, but he spent a lot of time in Vienna. was a member of this group. There, there were others like the uh, mathematician Hans Hahn. I'll put him down. It was uh, The great philosopher Wittgenstein was not a member of the group, but the group was influenced by him and sometimes uh, had conversations with him, but they probably misunderstood his views, but he was had some association with them. And the one person who was, the one really Mises hated, who was a member of this group, was Otto Neurath. 
So, uh, according to Mises, see, he thought Mises had a rather non-standard view of this group. He thought the reason, the, sort of the principal motive that this group had for their views on epistemology was that they wanted to, they were socialists and they knew that economic theory would tell against the socialist views they had, so they wanted to invalidate economic theory, so that was why they were trying to come up with some of their their views on epistemology. Now, the ba- what is the basic criticism that uh, the positivists, logical positivists, had of praxeology? Well, what they said, something like this, uh, suppose we have a we're talking about, we want to talk about what's true about the world. Like we say, we're now here at the Mises Institute, or uh, we're living in the United States. Uh, these are empirical propositions. Uh, according to the, uh, the positivist, an empirical proposition is one that holds only in certain particular circumstances. Uh, if something always holds, if this is something is necessarily true, then according to them, it's some, it's, uh, the proposition is purely verbal. It's a tautology. Uh, supposing an example, this is actually one I think comes from Wittgenstein's first book, the Tra- Tra- Tractatus, uh, uh, it's not, uh, Suppose I say it's raining, as it was this morning. It's that's an empirical proposition because we can have another state of affairs where it's not raining. So we, it's sort of the statement is kind of partitioning the world in a certain way. We can say some cases it's raining, some cases it's not raining. So it's conveying some information to us when we say it's raining. We can come up to see an alternative that might not, it's not raining. But suppose I say either it's raining or it's not raining. So I haven't given you any information. What I've said is true, but it's just uh, it's just an application of a certain logical law. It isn't telling you anything about the world. So according to the logical positivist, any claim we have that certain features, say that Mises is making, such as certain features of action are necessary. We, anything wouldn't be an action if it didn't have those features. That's simply a definition. According to them, all that Mises is saying is that he's proposing to use the word action in certain ways, but he's not telling us anything about the world. Uh, say Mises is saying, uh, your an action is use of means to achieve end. Well, then he's he's not going to count anything as an action that doesn't is not using means to achieve an end. But that doesn't tell us anything about the world. Whether there are actions in the world, that's just saying how he's proposing to use certain words. Uh, now, is this criticism a good one, uh, you'd probably not be surprised to find out that I don't think so. Otherwise, it would be hardly likely that I'd be giving, be asked to give lectures here at the at this institute if I thought that the uh, logical positivists were correct. But we can see what's, what's wrong with what they said uh, from what I mentioned earlier, that Mises is not starting off with the concept action as sort of some sort of an idea in his mind or a word that he's defining. He's talking about actions out there in the world. The claim that he's making is that we directly know, we know directly there are actions in the world. So the concepts are not purely mental, but the concepts are right out there in the world. It's not, they're not separated sort of out. It isn't that we have sort of some sort of empirical notion out. Uh, Yes. But how can we know? How can we know the act? How can robots are robots? 
the, the question was, uh, how do we know that uh, human uh, that human beings act and that they're not uh, robots or controlled by some god? Well, uh, uh, I think Mises, uh, now it's sort of a, a kind of a funny answer I could give you is who's asking. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I think what Mises would say there is, or at least what I would say, I shouldn't say what Mises would say, is when we say we know something, this isn't dependent always on some explanation of how we know this something. We do know, we're, we, we claim that we're given this in the world. If, uh, if we ask, if it were suggested that, say, in a particular case, uh, say, this isn't, uh, we're dealing with something that isn't an action, but some robot who's acting. Some people have, might think this about the way I deliver lectures, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but that would be something that could be investigated in a particular case, but there wouldn't be any I don't think we would need some sort of general proof that people act. We wouldn't need to start with the assumption, well, uh, there's some sort of, uh, starting off, say, with particular ideas in people's minds, and then say, well, can we figure out whether people are acting? And no, the claim is that we're given that people act. This is something we directly encountered. It isn't a theory that people act. It's something we directly encountered. Uh, uh, yeah? Uh, in all scientific history, without that, and you expect... Uh, uh, yes, uh, the suggestion was uh, that, uh, I think that Mises points out that uh, well, if you... We're, in the sciences, we're assuming there's some sort of uniformity of the way the mind works, and if we were to reject uniformity, then we'd have to throw out the sciences. Well, I think that's true, although that wouldn't really defeat all kinds of skepticism. That would just say, if say a skeptic could say, well, sure, we wouldn't have science if you accept skeptical conclusions, but that's just what he's challenging. He just thinks, he wants to know how we know this. So the the response I was suggesting is somewhat different. I think that we don't need any general way of showing how we know things. Uh, yes, you can Also, uh, I don't know, so, you know, there's someone who would defeat the idea that you all need to be in that they would themselves engage in action. And that's the problem with the whole thing. And I Yes, uh, the, the suggestion was that the uh, question was that suppose somebody denied that human beings act, uh, well, uh, wouldn't he be acting himself? So he'd be refuting what he says. It'd be kind of so. I think. Well, I think this is a good point. If if the person were claiming that human beings never act, then he would be acting. He, he might just. There are other types of claims he might be making that might not be vulnerable to that. I mean, if he just that said uh, human beings act only very occasionally, that wouldn't be contradictory. Uh, yeah. But wouldn't the skeptic reply, um, no, it doesn't follow that I'm acting, I'm asking, you don't know, it's my I might be uh, giving you something I might talk about. Uh, well, uh, that's a very interesting question. The, the question was, uh, suppose the, couldn't the skeptic say to the person who said uh, that, uh, the person replied to the argument that if you say, deny that human beings act, that you yourself are acting and denying that, couldn't the person then say, oh, but what if the person was controlled in some way or under compulsion to say that, so he's not really deciding what to say. Uh, there, though, I think if you said that, then there would be the question, well, had he really made an assertion at all? Is he really saying something? Maybe we would just want to say there, well, there are certain words coming out of his mouth that would be an assertion if he were to make them, but he didn't make them. Uh, yeah. Could, could you not also respond that 
Um, yeah, for, it, it's a possibility that everyone is sort of pre-programmed and mm -hmm. no one is purposely acting. But so far as we can tell, we are, and we have no other way to deal with the world but to assume or not that it really, it's really pointless anyway. So whether or not sort of we're on some sort of pre-programmed deterministic, it doesn't really change the fact that we have to assume we are because there's no other way to think. Ah, uh, the remark was that well, even if uh, we were all on some kind of predetermined path, uh, wouldn't we have to? Wouldn't it make sense to assume that we were free to act? Because otherwise, we really wouldn't be able to uh, proceed. It's sort of. Uh, I think this is raised some very interesting issues. I mean, it, 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 I purposely. Uh, avoided, which is exactly <laughs> what sense, uh, uh, according to Mises, we're, we're supposed to be free, and what, and what does action uh, presuppose uh, de the, the determinism is false, or exactly. those are extremely complicated issues that would require uh, very, you know, it's, it's sort of very difficult to answer, but uh, the que I mean, the question that uh, if wouldn't we have to? You, I think you're right that uh, we certainly are given. I certainly see. It, we certainly uh, seem to us that we're making choices, and that unless there's some reason to question that, I don't think we would want to deny that. It would have to be a very strong argument. I mean, we might just want to say that. Well. If, if someone came up with an argument that we don't make choices, since we do make choices, there's something wrong. We know there's something wrong with the argument, even if we don't know what it is. Uh, but on the notion that it might, there's a possibility that we're all pre-programmed, I want to question whether that is a possibility. I, I want to know exactly what whether that makes sense or not, I'd have to think about that some more. I mean, I don't think we should we should take it as just an assumption that we're making choices that we have to take because otherwise we get into trouble. We we would wouldn't like the consequences. It seems to me we just we are making choices. At least that. Uh, yes. Yeah. Once you go into that realm, too, basically you have to be a nihilist because once you get to that point, you have to give up. If you're like, well, I can't know, there's no way to know for predetermined or you know, predestination controlled by some higher power, you mm -hmm. can't question anything else. So it's basically, yeah, you have to be a nihilist at that point. Uh, well, the, the suggestion was if someone thought we were pre-programmed to do whatever it is we do, he would have to be a nihilist. Uh, well, I don't think so, actually. I mean, someone could hold there are objective values, things that are good or bad, but that whether we acted in accord with those values was, was something that was not up to us that was determined. So he would then hold that we're always determined to do what we do, but nevertheless there are objectively good and bad states of affairs. That offhand seems to be consistent. Uh, yeah. You say that uh, the mythological individual deals with this problem, because if, if there is a God that's serious, if we still assume that we have this mythological individualism, then this God is serious in our own interests. So uh, it doesn't really matter if we're you know, controlled by somebody else as long as this, whatever it is, controls us individually in our own, in that individual's life. Uh, well, so, uh, uh, so, uh, the, the suggestion was that uh, the problem, as long as we accept methodological individualism, then it doesn't really matter because whatever suppose you assume that there's some power controlling us, it's controlling us in our own interest. Uh, I think uh, you're in, when we're talking about methodological individualism, we're just meaning that all explanations, uh, when we talk about actions, only individuals' acts or uh, reference to collective entities have to be cashed out in terms of individual action. There isn't an assumption that Individuals always act in their own interest, I mean, as opposed to, say, acting altruistically or acting in some other one's interest. Or, right? So, uh, 
that I don't think it would be, I think it would certainly matter. I mean, even, even though suppose we disregard that point and say there's some power that's always controlling you to act in your own interest, it would seem like that would be, make quite a difference to, uh, it would make quite, that would be quite a different situation from saying you yourself are acting, whether in your own interest or not, even if it had, uh, might have a similar outcome, but it would be quite a different thing, wouldn't it? I mean, uh, supposing that some power had made you ask that very question, wouldn't it be different from from you yourself asking it? It seemed. I mean, we could ask. We could ask. Might not have different consequences, but it certainly wouldn't be the same thing. Uh, well. Uh, do anyone, I think we're about out of time, but do you have, anyone have a last question? Uh, well, we see, well, we have a few questions, all right, well, well uh, okay, uh, let's see, maybe we're, maybe, yeah. Well, in response to the argument that perhaps we are controlled by the um, Nobel, I think the question is that make about argument, aren't you yourself attempting to have a personal debate with the choice? Your argument that is predetermined over his argument there. And the second point is, let's say someone is arguing that there's some predetermined or materialistic being by laws of nature. Isn't the fact that you can act contrary to these laws um, and thus suffer um, that you can possibly be truly natural being? For example, walking into a wall out of that contrary. Uh, well, uh, there were two points. There was one, the first was if someone is arguing that we're all determined, isn't he? trying to get the other person to choose to accept what he says so he's somewhat contradicting himself. Well, I think there, though, he could say what he's trying to do is to cause by what he says the other person to choose to to agree with him. So he's not trying, you could say he's not, he would say he's not trying to uh, influence the other one's act to free choice of agreeing. He's just trying to change the he, he's, he, his, what he's doing will affect the cause of what the other person is doing. And our second point on was that, uh, don't we sometimes contradict laws of nature, say, well, I'm not sure you really could go against the law of nature when you're walking into a wall. I think you're illustrating various laws of nature. I don't think you're contradicting me, but even, even if you could, in some sense, contradict the law of nature, that wouldn't be inconsistent with determinism. It might be, it would be inconsistent with the view that we're determined all, always by laws of nature, but that would be something else. Well, I think we're about out of time, so thanks very much.